Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our breakout session titled Balancing Work and Cancer. Uh, I'm Elena Janot and I'm the Vice President of External Relations here at NCCS and I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Rachel Becker. Uh, Rachel is the Senior Director of Programs at Cancer and Careers, a nonprofit that empowers and educates people with cancer to thrive in their workplace by providing expert advice, interactive tools, and educational events. Uh, during Rachel's session today, uh, I will be the moderator and I'll be reading through your questions. Please feel free to send them in the chat box down below. Um, and then after her presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. So we look forward to this session and, and hope that it's interactive. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thanks for joining us today, Rachel. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, virtually, as we all are. It's so wonderful that we have this technology that can help us all be together during this strange, strange time. Um, so for those of you who may not heard of, have heard of Cancer and Careers, um, I have a little bit more information about us. We were founded back in 2001, and we are the only organization in the United States that is solely focused on the issues that sit at the intersection of work and cancer. Uh, we provide support through a number of programs and resources, all of which are always provided free of charge. We have a website that is available in both English and Spanish, as well as another of public, a number of publications that are also available in both English and Spanish. We will ship those, uh, those publications in hardcover anywhere within the United States for free if you're interested, and they can also be downloaded as PDFs from our website. Additionally, we offer career coaching as well as educational webinars that take place throughout the year and are archived through our website. We also have a couple of events coming up that are specifically designed for this time during COVID-19, and I will talk a little bit about those as we go through the presentation. Um, and then, of course, we also participate in community events as well. So obviously, for external organizations who are giving presentations, what we're doing here today, and then we also offer uh, larger programs within our, um, that we produce ourselves. So for example, we have our national conference on working cancer, which is actually happening this coming Friday. And that is happening on Zoom also. We still have room, uh, registration is still open. And we would love to have you join us if you're interested in spending a full day taking a deeper dive into some of the topics we're gonna talk about today and then many, many others that all sit at the intersection of work and cancer. Okay, so as we get started, it occurs to me that a lot of you are likely in different places in terms of your own story. Excuse me a second while I readjust my window here. Um, a lot of you are likely in different places in terms of your own story and your own journey uh, with your diagnosis and employment and all of that. Some of you may have just received a diagnosis. Others of you may have already made some decisions yourself about work and cancer and how to help bring those things together in your life. And that makes you experts in your own right on this subject. Um, some of you may be squarely into survivorship, but dealing with some long-term side effects of therapy, or maybe you're looking for your first job ever. And then, of course, with everything that's going on in the world right now, there's a whole extra layer in terms of thinking about work and employment that adds some complexity to the conversation. Um, and so you may notice as we move through this that the slides that I'm going to share with you today have an arc to them. Uh, this is not because we think that life moves in a clear story arc. Uh, we are certainly learning that lesson right now. And and while we are going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the current environment with the pandemic that we're facing right now, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about it. But what we are going to see as we move through the arc is that there's this kind of shape that we've given the information simply for the purposes of being able to communicate it to you in what I hope is going to be a clear and useful way. And I would encourage you as we're going through the presentation to remember that um, just because we say that information is relevant for somebody who is newly diagnosed, it doesn't mean that there isn't also a way to apply that information if you're a little further along in your journey. Um, so I encourage you to, to kind of keep that open way of thinking as we're moving through the deck. And regardless of where you are, 
I think you can probably relate to the idea that sitting down to make decisions about how work and treatment are going to come together, together often means answering a whole lot of individual questions, which sometimes have conflicting answers. Um, we can't always make things come together in a clean way, and that all can feel very overwhelming. But acknowledging that conflict and, and knowing that it's not ideal, but it is okay, and there's still a way to, to find a path forward and make some critical informed decisions about working cancer. Um, often that involves actually physically gathering some information to have in front of you that you can look through in order to inform some of those choices that you're making. But when you set off to start kind of attempting to put order around all of these questions that you may be facing, there are two key questions that you can ask yourself to help to start to carve a way through. The first is how important is work to you personally? And then the second is what information do you need to have in order to make some good choices about working cancer? And from there, of course, there are some additional questions that very organically start to follow along. So things like how is treatment going to affect work and schedule? And vice versa, right? Do you need to take time off for surgery or treatment? Uh, is someone on your healthcare team able to talk to you about the way that side effects might be kicking in so that you can kind of map out periods where you might be feeling more productive versus periods where maybe you're feeling a little bit more fatigue or run down? Uh, you know, can you, can you schedule treatment around what your work needs are? You know, sometimes, we go in to see a doctor and the doctor says, hey, come in on Tuesday to get your next treatment. And the doctor is saying that because Tuesday is when the next appointment is available. And it's not necessarily because there's a medical reason to take that appointment. But you know, if you have a work event that you've been looking forward to that you want to attend, you know, it can be very worth saying to the doctor, you know what, Tuesday is not going to work for me. Are there any other days next week? Can we be a little bit flexible with how this works? Also thinking about what actually goes into working for you specifically. And I'm not just talking about the things that happen on our job site, right? So, you know, again, clearly right now, it's a little bit of an outline time in terms of, of, of how we're all doing our jobs. Many of us are working remotely these days, but we assume that there's gonna be a time where we are all back physically in person going into workplaces and so, thinking about whether um, what a commute might look like, right? If you have a 45 minute commute each way in rush hour traffic, your 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. job is actually 7.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And so that's an 11 hour day. And is that gonna continue to be realistic if you start experiencing fatigue uh, as part of your treatment? Um, and then of course, no person is only their diagnosis and their job. Do you have kids who need help with their homework? Is that something you spend time on during the week? Maybe you have aging parents that you're responsible for taking care of or a painting class that you've just started taking that's really helping you to discover some things about who you are and what your passion is. And, and that could uh, be a really useful coping mechanism during this time that you wanna save some of your internal resources for. Because as this pie chart that you see on the bottom right hand corner of the screen suggests, we don't have an unlimited pool of internal resources, right? We get this circle and then we make decisions about how we're going to divide it up and dedic dedicate our energy as we're moving through our lives. And as I'm sure many of you already know very well firsthand, as treatment progresses, that pool of energy in internal resources often starts to get smaller. So how are you gonna think about the way that the divisions get shifted uh, as time progresses? Also thinking about how flexible your work environment is can be very key when you're starting to make decisions about how this is all gonna come together. And we're gonna talk about that shortly in greater detail. And then of course, for many people, financial and insurance needs are key decision drivers in terms of making these choices. But the fact is that that's not true for everyone. For many, first and foremost, work is a part of who they are. 
And so suddenly thinking about the fact or having confront the fact, having to confront the fact that the way that we are doing our jobs may have to change and it may be compromised a little bit. That can very understandably be distressing. And of course, not everyone has that relationship to their job, but if that resonates with you, um, you know, maybe finding someone to talk to about it, a social worker at your cancer center, for example, um, or a therapist if you have one, somebody who can help you think about the ways that self-care might be a part of helping you to navigate your work and cancer journey. So I mentioned that um, you may want to gather some information in order to start making decisions about working cancer. And this slide is wonderful. It's one of my favorites. It actually breaks down very cleanly into three buckets. The types of information that you may want to collect as you start making these decisions. So I'm going to let you look at that for just a second. And of course, the first bucket we just spent some time talking about, which is medical treatment medical and treatment information. And just like it's often key for you to speak up a little bit when making your appointments, it can also be key for you to help your medical team to understand where you're coming from in terms of not just how you feel about continuing to be able to work, but also what specifically happens at your job. So for example, um, we very often will tell people, they'll say, what do you do? And we'll tell them our job title. Right, so if somebody says, I'm a museum grader, what does that mean? What have they actually told us? Does that mean that they're the first person that somebody sees when they come into the museum and so they sit all day and they take admission tickets? Or does, is that what they call tour guides? And they're actually on their feet every day walking around the museum to do their job, right? So it can very often be helpful as you're having these conversations with your medical team to go a little bit into what the specifics of your job are that you may be concerned about to figure out whether it's possible to work during all or part of treatment. The second category, of course, is workplace information. So this includes things like leave and insurance policies, uh, pre-existing flexibility options in terms of telecommuting. Um, many of you may already know what those are um, very well at this point in time. But of course, it's always a really good idea when you're thinking through this particular category to pull out that handbook that you were probably handed when you first started your job. Um, maybe you spent some time looking through it. Maybe you didn't. Um, you know, it's very common for people to just kind of get that and, and put it to the side until the time that they need it. And of course, this is the time that you might need it. It can be very helpful to get a sense of what's already available to you so that uh, you know what questions need to be asked versus where there's a paved path that can be of support to you. And then of course also critical is to do some legal fact finding in advance. And I bring up this topic not because I think a work, in, a work situation is likely to become litigious, but rather it's because Laws exist for us as tools, and certainly when it comes to work in cancer, there are, um, there are laws that are in place that, that you may have access to in the workplace. Not everyone has access. Uh, there are some requirements that you might need to clear. We're going to talk about those in a second. But those laws can, are, for many people, they end up being the key tool that helps them to carve their past forward through the protections that are available. Um, so again, figuring out what federal protections might be available to you, what state protections might be available to you can all be incredibly useful as you start to map out this part of the journey. Okay, so the key law that we're going to talk about for the purposes of today's conversation is one that's called the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so my goal today in giving you a little bit of background is to, to try to give you a foundation to understand um, how this information could be applied to help perhaps solve some practical challenges that you might be facing at work. And then really to give you a sense of where you can go to find more information if you, about the law and how to use it if you think that it's something that may be beneficial to you, to your specific situation. So to start, the ADA is a federal law, 
meaning that it applies in all 50 states. And the part that is relevant to work in cancer comes from Title I. Like all laws, it has certain requirements that must be met, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So in broad strokes, these are the requirements that one would need to, to make sure that they check the boxes for in order to access the protections available. So the first one actually pertains to the employer that you work for. And the law says that your employer must have a minimum of 15 employees for the law to apply to them. It's important to mention here as well that there are some state laws in place that expand on the protections that are laid out in this law. And not every state has it, but it's worth looking into to finding out whether the one in your, whether your state does, does do this. But one of the ways that it often implements this expansion is by bringing down this number requirement. So for example, I'm in New York State, and in New York State, the requirement is four people, not 15. That's a pretty big jump. So again, this can be a useful, it can be useful to look to your state law beyond the ADA. Also, second qualification to use the ADA, you must have the necessary skills, certifications, et cetera, to do your job. Um, for most people, this is a, this is a, pretty simple one, you are likely hired to do your job because you have the necessary skills and qualifications to do it. And then the third is that the disability that you have, whatever physical or whatever symptoms that you might be having, maybe there are invisible symptoms, maybe they're visible symptoms, but and coming along from, as side effects from treatment, they must meet the criteria of a disability as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so if you meet all of these requirements, the protections that the ADA offers are protection from discrimination. And then it may also provide access to reasonable accommodations. And in a few slides, we're gonna spend much more time talking about reasonable accommodations, what they are and how you can think about some that might be, uh, might be relevant for you. So again, this is just a quick overview so that you know that the ADA is something that's available to you or could be available to you, I should say, that you might consider. And I encourage you to speak with a legal professional to determine if you're eligible to use the ADA's protections, if this sounds like something that might be useful for you. Now, I wanna take a quick moment to step out of the workplace and into the virtual space and talk about that for a second because there is some overlap between the two that's important to consider as you're mapping out your progress here. So there's been quite a bit of research on hiring trends in the past few years. And what we've been seeing is that both current and future employers are Googling employees and job candidates respectively. Probably not surprising to anyone. There's almost nobody these days who's not using Google for something or other. Uh, but in the case of employers, it, it's good to know that usually this is not, the searching is not done maliciously. Um, in the case of somebody who is hiring uh, or looking to hire a potential candidate, it, usually they turn to Google because that person made a great impression. And so they wanna find out more and they wanna have some additional information to support an argument to hire that individual. Um, in the case of people who are current supervisors, often they want to find, more, uh, find out more about the individuals that they are managing so that they can have person-to-person -person conversations with them and not just be seen as, you know, the mean boss who's always barking orders. But regardless, those searches can lead to the discovery of information that you might have preferred not be public in your work. And I travel all over the country giving presentations, or I did prior to 2020. It's been a little bit slower this year, but I've been doing this for, I have, I have five years of experience prior to this year, so I've done it quite a bit. And I've heard a, a whole vast array of stories about how much people love the internet and cancer survivors specifically in terms of the support that it provides for them during their cancer journey. And, and into survivorship as well. You know, it creates a sense of community. Um, sometimes people blog to help them process the information and, and um, there really can be an incredible benefit to it. So I don't want to at any point for it to sound like I'm saying, stay away from the internet, don't talk about your cancer journey on the internet at all. You know, cause I'm not, I want people to, 
to be informed and use the internet in the ways that feel comfortable for them and best serve them. But it is important to know, and this is a point that I, want to, I do want to make, is that we're all creating a written record that's relatively difficult to get rid of whenever we post online. It's kind of like a tattoo in that sense. You know, you can go, you can have a laser treatment and get a tattoo removed, but there's always going to be a, a remainder of it, you know, a little reminder of what was there at first. So, um, so while posts can be deleted, it can often be challenging to get things removed entirely. And again, like I was saying, I, I really want you to just kind of make informed choices about what you're sharing online. Um, and that's largely because, you know, some of our mainstream social media platforms that a lot of us use, specifically Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, they're there to make money, right? They make money from advertisers. And the way that they make money from advertisers is by selling the personal data of their users. Um, there's a great upside to this. First of all, we have these free tools. We never pay for these tools that help us stay connected with so many loved ones that we don't get to see all the time. And certainly, again, in this moment where so many of us have been social distancing, social media has been an outstanding tool. But it is a good idea to review any privacy policies before sharing information on any website. Uh, what's more good news is that some of these social media platforms have made it a little bit easier to understand their policies and they're trying to help people out now in light of some scandals that have come up in past years. But I do encourage you to check out privacy policies and, and make sure that the, those on your account are set at the level that feels right for you. Additionally, there are sites with a greater level of privacy that are specifically designed for people who are going through a medical experience. I have two of them listed on this slide right here, My Lifeline and Caring Bridge. I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with them, if not all of you. But again, this, you should be aware that there are privacy settings here on these, on these profiles. They do not default to being 100% protected, but you can easily, easily click some, some, make some click selections to get your profile as protected as you want it to be. And this link that you see at the bottom of the slide is to um, uh, our charts and checklists page where we do have a document called Maintaining Online Privacy which walks you step by step through how to make sure that these two websites, My Lifeline and Carrying Bridge, uh, if you have a profile there, it is as private as you want it to be. So what we recommend, again, as we continue to think through all of this, is developing a personalized disclosure plan. And that involves making clear decisions about what, if any, information about your cancer journey you're going to share, both online and off. Um, but specifically in terms of online, it's important to also communicate to the people around you in your circles uh, what information you do plan and don't plan on sharing online. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard stories from folks who had a very, very well-intentioned loved one who posted because they were celebrating the fact that their sister finally made it through their, fi their final chemo treatment and isn't she a rock star and shouldn't we all just clap our hands and celebrate which is obviously a wonderful, wonderful um, sentiment, but for the person who was keeping things private and making sure that, that there were no pictures of her in the chemo suite that went up online, that was very distressing, right? So just having those simple conversations can be very easy to make sure that there's not an, um, an accidental disclosure of information. Also worth note, noting as well, that if you have, if you volunteer within the cancer community at all, which is, is something we also commonly see among survivors, you may want to consider the fact that in a job interview or in your workplace, that's something that people might ask you about. Um, you know, and, and often, again, well-intended question that comes up is, are you a cancer survivor? Which is something that you may or may not be prepared to address in the workplace or want to share publicly in the workplace. So just flagging that for now, and a little later on, we're going to talk some more about formulating responses to questions so that you can feel in control of your narrative. And then this slide has a couple general tips on how to build a professional online brand. Always a good idea to Google yourself, um, to use mainstream sites strategically to present yourself as a professional and to amplify your voice as the rich, dynamic human that you are. 
um, setting up a professional web page or blog. And then of course we talked about the fact that you can delete posts that no longer represent your interests. And while they may still exist somewhere like the rem remnants of that removed tattoo, uh, it's unlikely that those employers are going to go 16 pages deep into the Google results that they got from you in order to find information. So it's definitely less likely that they'll come across something in that way. Uh, and I will also mention that we have an archived webinar on our website that is called Using Social Media to Tell Your Best Story that is a full hour dedicated specifically to the ways that you can strategically leverage an online platform um, in order to build, your, to build your social brand. Okay, so let's move back into the workplace now. So to set the stage here, as we, as we transition to talking about working through treatment, I wanted to give you some statistics to kind of lay the scene here. And these come from a survey that we at Cancer and Careers did with Harris Interactive Poll just last year in 2019. And what we found was that, uh, what we, well, we asked a number of questions, we looked at a number of areas, but we asked people for the top reasons that they continued working after a diagnosis. And listed here are the top five that we found in this specific survey. People wanted things to feel normal, they wanted to feel more productive, work provided a routine, et cetera. And of course, what jumps out here to me and to many people who see these numbers is that of course, health insurance and finances didn't make it into the top five. They were on the list as options, but they didn't make it into the top five. And so this data really supports that idea that I was talking about earlier, that they're not key decision drivers for everyone at work has so much more, brings so much more to our lives than simply a way to pay the bills. We also found that 75% of surveyed patients and survivors found that working through treatment helped them to cope. And 74% of patients and survivors said that work aided in their treatment and recovery. So those are very high numbers. Of course, it's not everyone and that might not resonate with you, but if you are somebody who is thinking in this way, you are in good company according to the research that we've done. Now, this is a, a question that we get asked very, very commonly. Um, do I have to share the news of my diagnosis at work? And so when we think about disclosing at the work, at work or really anywhere, I, I wanna underline again that this, it really is an incredibly personal decision as to whether you share information or how you sh share your situation. Um, and also note that it's, it's not an all or nothing situation, right? You don't have to be an entirely open book or an entirely closed one. Um, you can always share more information, of course, it's kind of hard to dial back information what's that, once it's been shared. But just so we're all on the same page in terms of this specific ask, you are not required to provide information about your health or your health history to any employer, whether it's a current employer or a prospective employer, they're also not allowed to ask. So that said, there may be some situations where you could potentially have to share information in order to access your rights under the law, which as we talked about with the Americans with Disabilities Act. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean sharing every last detail. You just need to provide some information that could help support why you're making the request that you're making. And this is going to start to make more sense as we start talking more about reasonable accommodations in a few slides. Um, also, in, in terms of thinking about the ADA, one of the protections that it may provide is protection from discrimination, right? So if you work for an employer who has, you know, who you're concerned that that might be an issue with, disclosing that you have a cancer diagnosis could potentially, and again, you always want to talk to a legal expert to know for sure about your unique situation, but it could potentially provide you access to protections from discrimination because a person can't be discriminating against you if they don't know that there's something to discriminate against. Right. So, um, so that also might be a reason to disclose. Okay, so when thinking about um, actually sharing the diagnosis and what the conversation is gonna look like, or conversations, because often you do have to have more than one. There are two things to consider overall. 
The first is how is treatment going to interfere with your ability to perform your job duties? And then of course, what legal benefits there might be to telling. But there are also a number of other reasons why somebody might want to or not want to share information that have nothing to do with either of these things. So for example, you might want to consider uh, your work environment and the culture of the place that you work in. Um, some people work in environments that are very flexible and open and their colleagues feel like a second family and they spend Mondays talking about you know, what they did with their grandkids or their pets over the weekend, right? Um, so for that person, keeping the information private might feel totally inorganic and something that they're not comfortable with. On the other hand, I've spoken to a lot of people who work in very corporate and formal environments that are very, very competitive, and they are totally opposed to sharing any of this information because, you know, that's just not what gets discussed at work. And so they make the choice that they're only going to share as little information as they have to if it becomes entirely necessary. And again, all of these things exist on a spectrum. Also thinking about what your performance has been like up to this point and being truthful and realistic about it. So, you know, if you're somebody who's always gotten gold star performance reviews and you think that um, your doctors are telling you that there's likely to be some fatigue or some chemo brain that kicks in, you might wanna raise a flag and say, hey, this is going on and I wanted to give you some context because that, then when um, employee review time comes around again, your employer isn't having to fill in the blanks about why last year, you know, you got, you know, five stars, no question. Um, but this year things have shifted a little bit and they're kind of, again, filling in the blanks as to why that might be. And then of course your own personality comes into play here. Um, thinking about how you feel about disclosing information. Are you a sharer? Are you not a sharer? Are you somewhere in between in that some things are okay to share, but maybe medical information you're not too comfortable making public. And knowing that wherever you are, that's okay. And just thinking about that and factoring it into the way that you sculpt your narrative is gonna, is gonna help those conversations feel better for you. Now, if you, if you do decide that you wanna share information, um, the next challenge, of course, is figuring out who to do it with. Uh, for many people, that first conversation is very clearly one that's going to happen with their direct supervisor. Uh, many of us have an ongoing dialogue with our supervisors, and so there's somebody that we feel comfortable with and a person who understands our workload and can help us kind of come up with that plan for how things are going to continue to get done. Um, other people are not so comfortable with their supervisor, and so maybe they want to start with HR if there is an HR or um, department in a company. Not every company has an HR department. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you look at that handbook and there's a policy in there that says you have to start with HR if you're going to share this kind of information. So again, that's where that handbook comes into play here. And then finally, if you want to share with your coworkers, the best approach is often just to let them know what to expect. So again, there's not any guessing. Um, they have confidence that you know, that work is going to continue to be distributed evenly and, and all of this. But regardless of who you're having the conversation with, it's essential to prepare ahead of time. And always, whoever you're talking to in the workplace about what your journey is likely to look like, it's important to work in the idea that cancer treatment is fluid. That certainly at the beginning, what we know today is what we know today. And that might be different once we've had the third chemo infusion or six months down the road. And so working in that idea that this is going to be an ongoing dialogue, um, that there's going to be an ongoing degree of problem solving that happens is a wise choice often because it prevents us from having to, you know, from kind of making all of these promises up front and then discovering down the line that again, we have to dial them back in order to, um, in order to, to, you know, realistically meet what we can do. For many people, the idea of starting the conversation with their employer can be intimidating. That is incredibly understandable. And so this slide presents a couple of examples for you of ways that you might initiate the conversation. 
And you'll see in both of them, one key concept that gets worked in is the idea that, um, you know, acknowledging that you want to continue to do a good job, that's important to you, that you're concerned about making sure that the employer's needs are, ne are met, not just yours. Uh, and then also, we at Cancer and Careers have developed a manager's kit, which is a document that's actually designed to be carried into these conversations and handed to your employer to um, that contains some of the key information that they might want to take into account because it's entirely possible that your manager has never supervised somebody who has cancer before just as perhaps you're somebody who's never worked during treatment before so you're both having this conversation for the first time and those that printed information can go a long way in, in driving those dialogues now when we're thinking about side effects in the workplace Clearly comfort is of the utmost importance and that's something that you want to consider when you're thinking about what actually goes into to your job, and what the tasks are and what you need to do. But as we consider disclosure, it's also important to remember that side effects can themselves disclose information, even if we are not using our words to make those disclosures. So certainly physical side effects that are visible like hair loss or weight loss, um, changes in skin sometimes can can give a visual clue that can invite questions from somebody to say, you know, hey, and we actually, there was, I met a survivor in New Mexico a number of years ago who told us a story about being trapped in an elevator with somebody who wanted to know what great diet he had tried because he'd clearly lost so much weight and was looking fantastic. And it created this very uncomfortable situation for him because he hadn't said anything about his cancer at work. And is weight loss was not something that he really wanted to be talking about, right? Um, but it's also the case that invisible side effects can, can disclose us too. So if you're somebody who is very high energy and always taking on extra tasks and raising your hand to go get a birthday card when somebody has a birthday or a sympathy card if somebody has a loss, and you know that fatigue is gonna be a likely side effect and you probably won't be raising your hand as often or or with as much enthusiasm, that can invite questions too. And so again, it's really about knowing how to address these questions if they come up and knowing that again, you don't have to share all the information. You don't have to say, well, I'm having cancer treatment and that's why this is happening. Um, again, we're gonna talk about crafting answers as we go along, but keeping that in mind, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing disclosure and preparing responses ahead of time can prevent the accidental sharing of information you don't wanna be public because you've been caught off guard by a question. Now, chemo brain is a side effect that we get asked about most frequently in that it has a very big impact on many people in the workplace. And um, when it comes to thinking about how to manage it on the job so we can continue to be productive, it's really important to remember that unfortunately there is no magic bullet, bullet solution. It's about going back to basics and then figuring out what specifically is going to work for you. So to start with, let go of the idea of multitasking. You know, we all, so many of us think that we are excellent multitaskers because we live in an environment where we get, you know, all these push notifications and email notifications and then, you know, we, we just think of ourselves as able to bounce back and forth. But the fact is that the human brain, no matter what your health history is, no matter what your age or your education level or any of the other individual factors that make us us, um, human brains just aren't really designed to focus on more than one piece of information at a time. So developing habits where that's your approach. Don't multitask. Write things down. Write down prioritized lists that can help you know how to attack the items that you need to attack. Um, do them one thing at a time. Take notes during conversations so you have them to refer back to so you're not relying on your memory to be the sole, like, how, uh, what's the word, housing center of information. Um, rehearsing conversations that you might need to have. So, of course, if you're doing a presentation like this, generally a good idea to practice. But also, you know, if you supervise people and um, you need to, to give some instructions on how to carry out a particular task, perhaps having that, some written down notes and practicing ahead of time what you're gonna say so you don't find yourself grasping for words in the moment. 
And then of course, building breaks into your day as well can go a really long way. Um, stress impacts our focus. So figuring out how you can, can wor work through that can make a huge difference. Um, identifying a point person who can be a centralized source of information for you if you're out of the office is, is often very useful. Um, in terms of you know, making sure that you stay in touch with what's happening on days that maybe you're out for whatever reason or periods of time that you're not there. And then of course, communicating is key also. So when you're thinking about writing that prioritized to-do list, it might be a good idea to go over it with your supervisor and make sure that you're thinking about things the right way so that you're not guessing, doing any guesswork and finding out the hard way that there was something that was of a higher priority. And of course, this last one is one that I think people struggle with, again, regardless of, of where they are in their lives and what their health is, but knowing what your limits are and setting boundaries about, around them and articulating those in a way that helps you to still present yourself as an engaged and employee who cares about their work and cares about what they're doing. Um, it's a really good skill to have. And so again, I have some examples on this slide of what, um, limitation setting might look like. And I'll also say that, you know, at Cancer and Careers, we, we have a phone number that you can call. Um, I'm a social worker. We have another social worker on staff and all of our staff are fairly highly trained. And so um, if you wanted to practice this, this is something that we can practice with you. We do it all the time and I've gotten a lot of good feedback that it's really helpful. So I've been talking about reasonable accommodations. We mentioned that those are one of the protections that you might have access to by the ADA. And um, we're gonna spend some time talking about those, what exactly those are now. And specifically, there are modifications to your job, your schedule, or the environment that you work in that make it possible to perform your essential duties. Also worth noting that they, these protections are available during the job search process, although we're gonna spend less time talking about that specifically. Rather than continue to talk around what they are, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories, some examples of people that we've worked with who have successfully used reasonable accommodations. So this first example comes from a social worker who we worked with a number of years ago. She left her job, it was very, very key part of her identity, but um, as her treatment went on, she found that when she was at work, she experienced a really debilitating nausea. In and of itself, that's obviously not an unusual side effect to come along with chemotherapy. But what was a bit strange was that when she was home in the evenings, wasn't near that level at all. And then similarly, on the weekends when she was home during the same hours that she was at work during the week, she also was not feeling that same level of nausea. So we went back and forth with her. We asked her a number of questions. And what we ultimately discovered was that the office that she worked out of was right next to the cafeteria. And so the smells of the food cooking were blowing into her office and that was causing her to feel nauseated. So for her, the reasonable accommodation was to switch offices with someone so that she could be further from the cafeteria. Another example is Frank. So Frank, was experiencing a lot of fatigue as a result of his treatment. And he worked at a finance and operations team at a big company. Um, he had to do a lot of printing as part of his job. And the room that had the, that had the printer that his computer was connected to was located two floors down from where his desk was. So every time he printed a document, he needed to go down two flights of stairs and then up two flights of stairs in order to get it which became increasingly difficult with the fatigue as treatment went on. So for him, the reasonable accommodation was for the company to buy a printer that he could keep at his workstation. Very simple, not particularly expensive, and it made it possible for him to continue to do his job. There are a number of questions that you can ask yourself to help identify potential reasonable accommodations. So for example, can you work a full-time but flexible schedule? So meaning the same number of hours, but distributed differently, right? If you know that you feel better in the morning and not so great starting in the afternoon, maybe your nine to five workday becomes seven to three. So you can maximize those earlier hours when you're feeling at your best. Um, can you work from home full or part-time? 
And obviously, as we've been saying, this is a moment in time where many of us have learned whether or not <laughs> we're successfully able to do that. Um, and it's not going to be the case for everybody, right? Uh, I, you know, somebody who works as a lifeguard and may need to jump in a pool to pull out a child to make sure that they stay safe, probably not going to be able to telecommute their job anytime soon, although I'm not a technology expert, so I don't know for sure. But the point is that, you know, it's about specifically what's going to work for your job. And, and as we go through these examples, these questions are to get you thinking. They're not going to work for everybody. Um, if you work in a job that has allocated break times, maybe you take more frequent breaks or additional breaks. Um, and that is a reasonable accommodation for you that helps you manage energy levels. Perhaps it's about getting access to special equipment. You know, we, um, we did a program a few years ago with a woman who, whose eyesight had been badly impacted by, um, by her cancer treatment, and she absolutely needed an anti-glare screen on any computer that she was going to work on and she needed to sit away from a window because she couldn't have too much light that was coming in and she needed to be able to control the light just in case. So these are the kinds of things that, that you would perhaps think about. Um, another possibility is having tasks moved off of your workload, you know, teachers not um, supervising recess so that they can save their energy to do the teaching part of their job might be an example of that. So, Again, this is a nice tool that you can come back to and start to kind of think through the lens of what your own environment might require. For people who have taken time off from work uh, for treatment and are looking, returning to an existing job, there are pros and cons to doing this. Um, probably the biggest pro is that it's a familiar landscape. You know, the cultures and the quirks, you know, your colleagues and supervisors, and you know the responsibilities of your particular role. So that means you don't have to spend a lot of time and energy figuring out how to be successful in your job. But of course, there are also cons associated with returning to a previous job. And probably the biggest one is that very insidious before picture that many of us carry um, from the time prior to treatment. As we know, cancer treatments are a bell that don't always unring or they don't always unring very quickly. And, you might find that your, you know, that your cognitive abilities are different, or maybe you have neuropathy, and so your ability to use your hands are changed. The list obviously goes on. Um, so it's wise to remind yourself that it's a good idea to ease back into the routine. Don't put the pressure on yourself to hit the ground running and prove to everyone, you know, that you're still capable. You're still capable. Um, take your time. Be gentle with yourself, um, and. And, um, you know, and come up with a plan, figure out what's going to work for you. For some people, you know, maybe they start working part time or, or maybe they start by engaging with their tasks from home before they actually go into the workplace. Again, it's really about what uniquely is going to work for your specific situation. Now, um, we hear the concern often from people who are returning to the workplace that they are going to be regarded by their colleagues forever as the cancer person. And um, so many stories over the years that I've heard about people being approached in the workplace um, with questions and comments related to cancer that really make them to feel uncomfortable, particularly you know, when people are returning to work, often the last thing that they want to talk about is everything that they just went through. And so to have well-intended colleagues, right? just trying to make a connection, but bringing these things up, it's nice to have some tools in your toolkit to help move the conversation to a place that you, where you feel more comfortable communicating. And that's what the swivel, which is described on this slide, is all about. So that's a verbal technique that involves acknowledging a cancer-related comment that was made, inserting the word and in there, and then inserting the information that, uh, you know, and then bringing up a topic of conversation that you prefer to, um, to prefer to discuss, right? Um, I'm sorry, you know, if somebody says to you, my uncle had cancer, you might say, well, I'm sorry to hear that. That must have been very, very hard. Um, but, but while I have you here, what did you think of the meeting that we had yesterday? There were a couple of questions I had, and I think that you might be just the person to answer them. People tend to pick up conversations from where we left them off. And so, um, you know, learning how to employ this in your workplace, in your life, can be really useful to 
keeping a conversation in a, in a place where you're, where you're okay sharing information. Of course, there are a whole spectrum of comments that you might get. My uncle had cancer is a pretty benign one, but in some cases there are, um, you know, comments that, that feel a little bit more uncomfortable. You know, a, a boss might say to you, well, you know, you've been looking exhausted recently, so I didn't want to overwhelm you by adding more to your plate. And maybe you look tired, but how you look doesn't really represent how you feel. That happens, right? So knowing how to say, I you know, I appreciate your concern, but my work is a really important part of my coping here. And and I've actually been thinking about some other things and I'd like to talk to you about it. It keeps us from getting stuck in that, you know, having other people define how we're seen. And then of course, there are just sometimes some insensitive comments. You disclose your super, you, to your supervisor and they say, oh, did you smoke or do you use tanning beds? Or again, who knows where they're coming from and asking these questions and I wish it didn't happen, but it does. And the example on this slide is, it's a lot of language, so I'm not going to talk through it. Um, I encourage you to read it. These examples are also up on our website, and you can email me afterwards if you're looking for, for where to find them. But having some, some pre-packaged responses that, you know, help you keep balanced, keep calm, and to know what to say in those moments so you don't accidentally say or behave in a way that doesn't match what your ideal presentation of yourself is. I want to spend these last few slides talking about job search. Um, again, these statistics at the top come from the study that we did last year with Harris Interactive. Um, and patients or survivors who were looking for work, we found 49% felt that prospective employers might treat them differently if they disclosed their cancer. 31% felt that their diagnosis might have limited their job prospects or their ability to get hired. And 49% expressed at least some concern about getting hired if a potential employer finds out about their diagnosis. So if you relate to any of this, again, you're not alone. Um, at the bottom of the slide, we have some statistics that come from some, some evidence-based research, some peer-reviewed research. And in a study with fake cover letters, researchers found that employers expressed 26% less interest in candidates who disclosed a disability than in candidates who didn't. And applicants who disclosed a cancer history received fewer callbacks from managers than applicants who did not disclose a cancer history. So essentially what that research shows us is that our survey findings are supported. That again, as much as we wish it weren't the case that there were discrimination in the hiring process, we know that it does happen. Um, still percentages under 50%, well under in some case, but we do know that it can happen. And so, um, when you're thinking about your job search and you're thinking about whether or not to disclose in a cover letter or resume, it's important to keep that all in mind. Some other things to think about um, is when you're thinking about a job search or really that it's not a secret that job searches can be challenging. Um, there are a lot of ups and downs and a lot of emotions that come with those ups and downs. And what I want to remind you is that, you know, it is a fluid process, it's a dynamic process, and the ongoing nature of it is something that is always true. Yes, we're seeing an increase in unemployment numbers in this country right now. They're in the newspaper all the time, and that is intimidating. I'm not going to pretend that it's not. But people were engaged in long job search processes before all of this happened. In up economies, it can just take time. People who have never had a cancer diagnosis experience long job search processes that are challenging and have lots of ups and downs. So keep it all in context that, you know, it's all part of the process and that there are steps that you can take in order to navigate those ups and downs. Be strategic. How are you reaching out to people? How are you trying to find new opportunities? What are you doing differently from day to day to week to week to try to keep it fresh? Um, and in terms of disclosure specifically, remember that just like any relationship building process, it's a good idea to be strategic with the information that you share. So we just saw on the last slide that there is some discrimination that we know happens in the hiring process when people share information about themselves. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, never share that information. It doesn't even necessarily mean don't share it while you're still looking for work. It's just being strategic about when you share it. So maybe not on a cover letter because that's not a dynamic 
exchange between two people, right? When you're in a room with somebody, you can show them who you are and what it's like to be around you and what you bring to the table that's beyond the accomplishments that are written on a piece of paper. Um, but that doesn't happen with, with a piece of paper. And so maybe you wait until you've had one interview or three interviews, or you actually have an offer on the table. Maybe not at all. Maybe you wait until you've actually started the job and disclose then or, or years down the line. The point is that your foot is on the gas once you're thinking about it. And again, it's not, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing situation. In terms of finding not new opportunities, key to remember that most jobs are found through networking, about 85% of jobs. Um, I wanna leave some time for Q&A, so I'm not gonna run through everything on this slide right now. But um, I will say that we are running a webinar on Thursday, June 25th called Networking During Social Distancing. So if you are interested in having a conversation about what you can do now, join us on Thursday, the 25th. Um, I mean, it'll be great information. It's actually the second time we're hosting it because it was so popular the first time around. Resumes and cover letters, also very important tools as well. Um, some tips here for what some well-constructed ones look like. And I'm also going to put a plug in for our job search toolkit, which is a publication that you can download that has examples on it. We also have a resume review service where you can upload your resume and we will pass it along to a career coach who will take a look at it. Um, that is all free and it's a great resource. We talked a little bit already about whether or not you should disclose your cancer history on your resume or your cover letter during an interview. Uh, I forgot I had this slide in here, so I'm just gonna skip past it. And uh, point to the fact that the swivel can also be really useful in an interview, right? A lot of people become very concerned about gaps on their resumes from time off that they took during treatment. Um, so if it comes up in an interview, you might say, well, you know, I was dealing with a family issue that's now resolved and I'm thrilled to discuss how my management skills can build the team and grow your business, right? The, it, the answer drives back to why this person is qualified for the job and a conversation about the job. And you'll notice that that initial acknowledgement of the question is very broad about why the gap happened in the first place, because you're not there to interview about your gap. You're there to interview about why you're the best candidate for the job. So again, Having prepared answers and not letting yourself get thrown when these kind of questions come up is key. And then of course, when it comes to researching an employer, it's, we do this not just to make sure that we're prepared to talk in an interview, but also to get a sense of who the company is that we might be working for. You know, if you're concerned about discrimination, you can find out online if a company has a history of discrimination lawsuits. And it might be good to find that out ahead of time before you research them. Is it big enough that you'd have access to the ADA? What does their insurance policy look like? These are questions that you don't necessarily wanna ask an interviewer early on in the process, but in the age of the internet, a lot of it is available online. And then of course, the goal of any job search is to start working with a new employer. So thinking about you know, how you can be successful is key. The pro here is that it's a fresh start. But the con, of course, is that you do need to spend some time figuring out the landscape, figuring out the tasks and how you're going to do them successfully in all of this. Um, but what I want to remind you is that nobody ever hires somebody with the intention of watching them fail. People hire the people that they think are going to make a difference, that they feel is the best person to do the work that needs to be done. So look for solutions, ask for help, be kind to yourself, take your time, and again, we're here at Cancer and Careers to have any conversations with you about this that, that you may want to talk through. Um, just some final slides with resources, which I'm going to move through really quickly so that you can have my contact information because I know we're short on time, but hopefully we can get in a couple of questions. And if we don't, you can email. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. That was fantastic. And um, you all have some really amazing resources for people. And we're just grateful for the work that you do uh, to help people in the cancer community. I think it's, it's really valuable and um, gave me a lot of things to think about um, just from the on the employer side about when uh, looking through resumes and, and interviewing people. So thank you for all of that. Um, we did put sure. the website down in the notes here so you all can link directly out 
to um, Cantor and Careers uh, if you're interested in finding out more and maybe joining one of their upcoming webinars. Um, we did have a question that yeah. I think is somewhat timely, and I know we're going a little bit over, but people can feel free to stay for a few minutes. And if you want to ask a question, you can do so in the chat box. But what would your advice be to people who are maybe have been working from home, but their office is going to be opening up to cancer survivors who are going to have to maybe return to a physical office and are feeling apprehensive about that? Uh, what, what can they do? So we've been getting this question a lot. So again, um, you're not alone, whoever answered this question. Um, what I recommend, what we recommend is um, having a conversation with your employer and asking questions first. So, because the fact is that a lot of employers are also concerned about bringing people back to the office and what that's going to mean. And, um, and a lot of them are putting plans in place to make sure that people stay safe. So asking about distancing, um, you know, is it going to be the case that you're all sitting on top of each other in cubicles again, or are they rethinking office spaces so that there's a way to, you know, there's just a little bit more air in between. Some places are doing staggered work schedules so that, you know, in order to help facilitate this. So is that something that's happening? Is there cleaning protocols? Start from a place of curiosity, mm -hmm. driving the conversation so that we're not coming in and just being anxious up front, right? Because it's entirely possible that a lot of your concerns are already being addressed. And then this could be something that you might want to reach out to a legal expert to talk about if you have concerns that are specific to the fact that you're going through treatment or recently out of treatment, um, maybe the ADA might apply here and a reasonable accommodation could be for you to continue to work from home if you have been, or to somehow you know, be accommodated in a way that can help you to be more safe, but really start from a place of curiosity and talking to your employer and remember that you don't have to come out of the gate saying, as a cancer survivor, I'm concerned about this. You can just be somebody, an employee who's concerned about this because yeah. everyone's concerned about this. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I think that's great advice. And I'm sure a lot of people um, watching are, are probably curious about, about that. I know we've had uh, a lot of people who are thinking about that return to work and what that means for them and, and for their family. So um, we Absolutely. appreciate that information. You know, one quote um, that you said today that really stuck with me was what we know today is what we know today. And uh, right. I think that's sort of a, a great place to end this on and just say, you know, that everyone's doing the best that they can day by day and um and really the uh the advice that you all put forth today i think is going to help a lot of people so i encourage you who have been watching to reach out to rachel if you have any specific questions and and join some of their um upcoming webinars and thank you so much rachel for taking the time today and walking us through your presentation Absolutely. And, and again, we have our conference on Friday, too. So if you're looking for more information, you can register. You can come spend a full day with us. We'd love to have you. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for participating. And uh, we're going to be shutting down for the day today. But we will hope to see you all back here Monday, the 22nd at noon for our next day of the CPAT virtual symposium. So take care. Thank you, everyone.